Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie O'Leary. Coming in live, uh, Mexico Mike down in sunny Cancun, Mexico. Uh, again, didn't expect to be recording uh, at all on this trip, let alone within hours of landing here. But here we are because Ethan Kaliak Manis was named the starter per Pete Thamel. And subsequently, Gavin Griffiths entered the portal uh, on the last day of the portal being open. So we are here to kind of talk it all out, kind of give a little more insight as to how these things came together. Uh, but first, as always, we are presented by Night and Day Apparel, calling all Rutgers students, fans, and alumni. Are you looking for new and unique Rutgers merchandise? Night and Day Apparel has you covered. From t-shirts and hoodies to drinkware and pet accessories, Night and Day focuses on bringing the Rutgers community exclusive, one-of-a-kind tailgating products. Be sure to check out the links in today's podcast description on their website and social media so you can stay on top of everything Night and Day, including new merch drops and promotional announcements. Shop now and keep chopping. So I don't think it's any surprise the eventual conclusion this coaching staff came to, naming Ethan Kaliak Manis the starter. The writing was kind of on the wall. You don't mm-hmm. really bring in the starter from your last stop into your new stop, unless yeah. you really like the guy, unless you really vibe to them. And uh, I, I would say in the spring game, things didn't necessarily look like Ethan was the sure thing starter. But mm-hmm. from everything I had heard over the course of the spring, Ethan really had kind of pulled away. Um, and it's, it's a little surprising with the timing. Are, are you also surprised by the timing of this? Or do you think Greg was doing a solid to, to Gavin letting him enter the portal? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've talked to people all morning about this um, within the program, close to the program. And everyone keeps saying the same thing. Greg did the right thing. Uh, he told Gavin basically like, hey, I'm going to name Ethan the starter. I'm going to give you a heads up so you could still enter the portal if you want. Uh, he didn't have to do that. Personally, as a football coach, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, yeah. it's all about culture. Like um, Greg always preaches culture, culture, family, trust, chop, FTC. Uh, the previous one was family, F-A-M-I-L-Y. Forget about I me. Forget I, love me. You. I love you. Blah, yeah, he blah, he yeah. still does that a little bit still. Um, but uh, it's more FTC now. But uh, yeah, no, it's, I get it. It's a culture thing. You did the right thing by your guys. And then I mean, you did the right thing by the players at the end of the day. Kids see that. Like, coaches see that. Um, yep. Maybe one day a coach is going to be like, you know, I've heard good things about Greg. Like, I'm going to go coach for him. I'm going to be his next OC or something. Or DC. Because <laughs> who, who knows how long Harris yeah. Simeon is going to be around. But, uh, yeah, um, that stuff plays a big factor. Um, and it's huge. And it makes sense um, from that perspective. But from a strategical advantage perspective, I, I don't like it because I'd rather have two guys that have veteran uh, – Veteran leadership, uh, game experience. I mean, experience, sure. The other, yeah, the other two don't have any experience. I mean, Johnny has that one game last year, which was like uh, I don't even know who it was. Some F- Through like opponent. four passes against Howard or Wagner. Sorry, Wagner. Yes, that's what it was. Um, so yeah, I mean, I get it. I think Ethan is the man for a job. Um, I think he's better than Gavin, and I think I've, we've kind of preached that over and over and over again. Yeah, we've said <laughs> um, it subtly and not so subtly. Uh, yeah, Gavin was, you know. He was beat out, plain and simple. They weren't going to just give Ethan the job because he had been with Kirk previously. You had to earn it. And I think everybody in the entire program understands you have to earn your job year after year. And you'd be doing the whole team a disservice if you handed a job to somebody just due to seniority, which Shiano has never really done, let's be honest. Like, to a fault almost. Like, where Shiano has almost given guys the job because they've kind of been better lately. Mm-hmm. Like he's, you've seen a lot of QB flip flopping with him in the 1.0 era. Oh yeah, and he's really resisted that. He gave Gavin the longest leash of any quarterback mm-hmm. he's ever had, mm-hmm. ever as a head coach. Yep. And Gavin was not ever able to seize that opportunity. And I think no throw illustrates that more clearly than that. Chase Winowich, Gabe Winowich, I'm sorry, uh, swing pass that he just yep. totally airballed in the spring game, the second throw of the game. It's the same pass he's been missing for four years since he's been at Rutgers. And at some point, like, maybe maybe Gavin just needs a new voice in the room. He needs a new environment to really unlock him because it just wasn't going to happen here. And maybe he makes improvements on the margins. Maybe he becomes a 50% passer. But still, that's not even, like, baseline acceptable for a Division One, not, not only Division One, but a Power Four now program. Like, nobody... Nobody wants Gavin to fail. Nobody wanted Gavin to transfer, really. I mean, some, some people maybe just disliked him for whatever reason. But 
everybody wants Rutgers to succeed. And I think that's where a lot of the strife came from between the Gavin versus Ethan versus everybody else kind of narrative. But mm-hmm. Ethan won the job in the spring and Gavin's going to transfer. That's just how things work in college football in 2024. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of want to talk about like the appreciation for Gavin because when he decided to come here, Rutgers didn't have a whole lot to sell. They had a program that was, you know, mired by scandal. It had a program that hadn't been to a bowl game in six years at the time. Um, he came on and, you know, Sean Gleason hadn't coached above the, you know, the FCS level for more than a year at, coming over from Oklahoma State. Previously, he was at Princeton. He took a chance on Rutgers. Rutgers took a chance on him. And I feel like the relationship, I wouldn't say it ever soured. It just didn't work out. You know, sometimes it doesn't have to have a catastrophic failure in order for things to, to break apart. Mm-hmm. It just didn't work. I hope Gavin goes somewhere and kills it. I hope Ethan comes in and kills it. Like I wanted Ethan, I wanted Gavin to just blow things up last year in a good way. It just never happened. You know, there were there was a lot of uh, money left on the, the the poker table last year for Rutgers, and I think Greg and everybody in the program knew that we couldn't have another year like last year with the momentum the program had, with all the guys they had convinced to come back, mm-hmm. with all the momentum moving forward, they couldn't afford to have those moments again. And that's why they brought in a guy like Ethan. And that's why a guy like Ethan won the, won the job. If we're being honest. Yeah. I mean, he, they, they went back and forth. There's a bunch of conspiracy theorists on our boards out everywhere else. Um, <laughs> say sure that else. again, but uh, yeah, they, uh, they're just sitting there like, Hey, like, you know, they brought him in and they, he knew he was going to get the job right away. And it's like, no, I, I, we watched practice. Like it was a legit, like one day's Gavin's turn. One day's Ethan's turn. One day's Ethan's yep. turn. One day's Gavin's turn. And it was with the ones every time they would just rotate every single day. And it was yep. just, they, they did what they did. And it was a legitimate competition. People were like, well, that's not a competition. It's only spring. I'm like, that's the, it's the whole point of it. Like it was 15 practices yeah. to figure out who's the guy. Um, he could have drug it out into summer and it, Gavin would have been stuck at Rutgers for another year. Yep. And then there goes a whole year of eligibility. Cause he already redshirted it. So, I mean, but going back to what you said, Gavin did lead them to a bowl game. Their first, first bowl win in what, eight years, seven years, something like that. First bowl win since the, uh, was it the continental tire bowl in, in Detroit in 2014 over UNC? Is that what it was? I know that's the last win. I, I'm trying to think if that's the name of the bowl or not. Um, regardless, it was it was a Detroit bowl game in December. The uh, the second year, I think, Rutgers was either the first or the second year the Rutgers was in the Big Ten. I think it might have been the first, actually. It was the first because that was 2014. Yeah. 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 That, well, was it Quick Lane at the time? or Quick Lane Bowl, yes. Quick Lane. Yeah, it was Quick Lane. Okay. But regardless, I mean, he, he had a decent year. There's some dog in the hallway barking. You probably hear it. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, he, it's not like he had an awful year. He had an awful year passing the ball, but the running aspect always made up for some things. I mean, what was it, 11 touchdowns, 500 rushing yards? You, you haven't seen that from Rutgers quarterback in God knows how long, ever. Yeah, maybe, maybe forever, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but Ethan's but got do, wheel, wheels himself. Let's, t- so like, let's touch on that, that running stat, though, because what percentage of those runs were designed <laughs> QB runs last year? 95%? I mean, yeah, all of them. Also, eleven yeah. touchdowns when seven of them were at the one yard line. I mean, yeah, and you have the Big Ten's leading rusher that you know you're deciding not yeah. to give the ball. Wh- whatever the reasoning is, we scored like touchdowns that, but, in those situations. Yeah. But um, yeah, we had a quarterback who basically was just designed run power. That's not mm-hmm. like a those runs aren't as valuable as scrambles. Like if you look at success rate, and I know we talked about this. Excuse me, ad nauseum, but. If you look at what like Jaden Daniels did in the run game last year, I would yeah. say 60 to 70% of his runs were not designed QB runs. They were mm-hmm. off scrambles because yeah. teams were playing man and nobody was spying Jaden and he just took off for 15 yards. Those are the mm-hmm. kind of runs that force defensive coordinators to have to kind of reconfigure how they're going to play a guy. Yeah. It's not the kind of runs where, you know, you line eight in a box and you just run, you know, QB Straight. off tackle <laughs> to the right or, you know, QB right. power to the middle. It's, those aren't necessarily like high impact, high efficiency runs the same way that like a scramble with a QB who understands Mm -hmm. like, Oh, this is an advantageous situation. I should take off here. Or like, you know, all my guys are covered. I'm just going to take the three yards to the sideline. That's like, Mm -hmm. that's not ever what Gavin did. Yeah. And so that's kind of the frustration I had is he got this reputation for a mobile quarterback. And certainly he has the athletic traits to Mm -hmm. be, a huge rushing upside type guy, but he never really understood when it was the right time to run when it wasn't. 
You know, he would never really read the defensive ends correctly on RPOs. Mm -hmm. We were constantly handing the ball off into packed boxes when he clearly could just take the ball for, you know, short to huge gains. Like the the few times he did take those uh, keepers, you know, you saw against Indiana, he took it 75 yards to the house. Mm -hmm. Like he had that ability, but he just never really did it. For lack of I don't think he had that, which is, that twitch either. Like that twitch is something you can't really learn. It's just something you have or you don't. Like he he yeah. saw a defender in open field. He's done. He's down. Whereas like mm-hmm. Jaden Daniels, like I mean, I'll even go back to like a Johnny Manziel type. They just open field. They're juking guys. Yeah, they're getting yep. away from guys. They're avoiding pressures. Like everything. Like it's just a different type of mobility. Yeah, that's that's so true. And you know, <clears throat> I, I do think that Gavin ha- or Ethan has. Uh, a, a mobility upside that isn't really uh, under fully understood because mm-hmm. you know he you know he kind of just looks like uh, I've compared him to to Mose from The Office uh, <laughs> Dwight's uh, cousin but he's just kind of like on. he's an underrated athlete I think um, I think he, I think you were telling me about how he like tested in the four sixes and in, 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 in the combine, the rivals combine circuit in high school. Yeah. Um, his run style is much more like, okay, everybody's covered and, you know, I can beat the defensive end. I'm going to run it and (laughs) take it right outside, get four yards and we're Mm -hmm. good. Um, That's the kind of rushing upside that you really want to see. And it's it's basically just a headsy play where a guy, you know, sees an opportunity and gets the free yards that the defense Mm -hmm. has given him. Um, Well, his his senior year of high school, actually, um, it was cut short due to COVID. So they only played six games in the spring and I'm looking now. He threw for 50, uh, 1,100 yards, 15 touchdowns. He also ran 40 carries for 250 and four touchdowns. Like, the guy's yep. got mobility. It's not like he doesn't. Yep. He um, His sophomore year, when they actually played a – his junior year got hurt. His sophomore year, when he played a full season uh, as a starter, uh, 600 rushing yards, 11 rushing touchdowns. That that's He's mobile. Like, he's more mobile than people give him credit for. Yep. So we talked about the one half of, you know, Gavin transferring. Let's talk about the other half of – Ethan winning this job. What do you think ultimately mm-hmm. it came down to why Ethan Kalik Manis won the job over Gavin Wimsett this spring? Uh, just accuracy, honestly. Um, I think when it comes down to it, they're going to still run the ball a ton. They're still going to be a run-heavy team. They joked about Shiraka in the pregame. Uh, Shiano did specifically saying, oh, air Shiraka today. Like, and it's like, yep. because they don't fucking throw the ball. <laughs> yeah, when they yeah. do throw the ball, they need an accurate quarterback. And I'm not asking someone to – to go chuck it down 50 yards down the field and hit that guy wide open. I just need someone that can hit a 10 yard out route basically, or 10 yard or, 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 or slant route. Even like, I just need something that can hit those guys accurately. And it goes back to what you said before. Gabe Winovich was wide open on the second play yep. of the game. And I think he actually threw behind him, like way behind him. It was him. behind him. It was yeah. way behind him. I think and three like- throws perfectly illustrate why Ethan won this job from the spring game. If you remember it, the mm-hmm. first is his first deep ball. Didn't seem Brantley. So this is coming off a series where Gavin had missed a deep shot. Ethan's first deep shot, up. just a perfectly thrown ball over Seam Brantley's shoulder mm-hmm. for a touchdown pass. Or not a touchdown, I'm sorry, for a, for a long gain. It was probably a 30-yard gain. The second was down in the red zone. I think it was the first touchdown they scored, the white squad, where it was just you know that, that glance route, that in-breaking slant to mm-hmm. Dino Kaliak Manis. Just a perfectly thrown ball. It's, it's kind of just like, you know, a a pass that's really hard to defend when it's thrown well. Mm -hmm. Um, And the third being that, uh, that pass to to Kenny Fletcher in the second quarter, I believe where, you know, I I think it was uh, an eight route where he's kind of going up and out towards the sideline uh, thrown, you know, with anticipation as he breaks away from his defender, he actually has room to, to, break away and, and continue the, the, the yak ability. And I think he got like 30 yards. And if that ball is mm-hmm. poorly thrown, it's, it's, you know, it's lucky to get caught period, but if it's just caught where he is, it's a 10 yard gain. But yeah. Kenny Fletcher was able to turn it into like a 30 yard gain because it was thrown on time and on target with the mm-hmm. ability to get those yards after catch. I mean, here, here's the, uh, the Brantley. Oh, no. Here's the Brantley one. <clears throat> Total chase dot desk with a pump fake. Uh, huh. And I mean, yeah, it's like, just right out of the defender's reach and right in his hands. Like, yep. Uh, I don't know which this one is, but it's all his throws. He made, he did make a couple mistakes too. Like, that's not, that's not say he's like the greatest oh, quarterback of all time. Like, <laughs> the, but, the second attempt of the game he had should have been a pick six going the opposite way. And we, yeah. I think we kind of hit on like the things that 
he's going to do that's going to frustrate people is he's going to have a couple throws a game where it's just putting yeah, like the ball that, in harm's yeah. way. Like that, that is a fine safe, completion there yeah. because it's a safe incompletion. The mm-hmm. stuff you can't do is what he did the second throw of the game to Isaiah, basically handing the ball to Isaiah Crumpler. Oh, Crumpler. But this yeah. is that Dino pass where it's just, yeah. you know, boom, right on the money, coming off the play action. This one you can't really throw it much better than that. But I mean, uh, yeah, he's just, he's a solid quarterback. I'm not saying he's going to, like I said in the last pod, he's not going to be light years better than any, uh, than Wimsat, but he's going to be better. And end of the day, that's all you can really ask for because you're still going to run the ball probably 40 times a game. So I think, so that's, that's Kenny the Kenny Fletcher, Fletcher pass. So yeah. if you, clearly Kenny Fletcher's an athlete I mean, we haven't seen yeah. it at the tight end in a while, but like if that pass is poorly thrown, he's basically getting tackled as he catches it. But because it's thrown on target in front of him, that should have been a sack right there. And this yeah. is not a great throw, but it's, it's one. out of harm's way. But Kenny because Fletcher he throws one, it yeah. in a place where Kenny Fletcher can catch not it and one. run, Shit, you know, it creates an additional 12 to 15 yards of offense that otherwise would not be there. I mean, it's and just we've a... talked about that so much about what Gavin does. Is, yeah, Even the completions he had sometimes were just like, okay, he hit an open receiver, but the guy had to basically dive to the ground to catch it. So all that mm-hmm. yak ability – all those yards that were there hypothetically to gain are mm-hmm. gone now because gone. he's down. He's you know he's on the turf trying to catch the ball rather than catching the ball in an area that allows him to turn a field. Mm-hmm. I'm really intrigued to see how he uses Dremel because like we've seen Dremel have yep. so many opportunities where he could have more yardage and he would make a diving catch like wide open like yes. six yards yep. off the line of scrimmage like an extra couple yards it's first down and you don't have to worry about anything so. Yep. I think that's all you really need from him. Just very basic stuff. It's nothing crazy, but I think it's going to be a – it should be a really good year, to be honest. It will be. And these are the kind of like I, – I said it before, but it's like – it wasn't on the pod, but it, it's like, you know, big boy decisions have to be made when you're playing big boy football. And, like, when you're mm-hmm. bad, you don't really have to make those tough decisions. But when you start to get good, you know – you have to make decisions that are uncomfortable. And this is a very uncomfortable decision, I'm, I'm sure, for Greg, because everything we've heard is Gavin is a great kid. Like, mm-hmm. everybody loves him. Like, nobody wanted him to fail. But, you know, circumstances dictated that you just had to find somebody else. Yeah. And they did, and here we are. But mm-hmm. Talking I, I feel really good about Ethan coming in and being a competent – quarterback like basically able to do what kirk wants in his scheme like kirk Mm -hmm. recruited him out of high school had him in his first year there he had some flashes if you look at that you know minnesota game minnesota wisconsin game at the end of its first season you look at the bowl Mm -hmm. game like he really made some huge strides over the last month of the season and then kirk leaves and they have a first time oc who doesn't really know what he's doing and things kind of fall apart but i do think that having another system and seeing what did work, what didn't work. I'm sure there's going to be things that Ethan can say like, Hey, you know, I love what you did here, but like, this is what like really worked for me in my second year at Minnesota that we didn't do. Mm -hmm. Like seeing another way of doing things can help in a lot of ways for seeing, okay, this is definitely not going to work. And this actually Mm -hmm. Kirk, you know, we never did this, but I really like this concept or whatever, or this kind of route combination. Um, I, I think the, the best thing about Ethan winning the job is that we all know the running game is going to be the first and second and third option in this offense. But when it comes to, you know, you know, nut crunching time when we're third and five and we need a completion to extend a drive, I feel a lot more confident with a guy like Ethan who given I had limited experience, limited experience, rooting for the guy outside of the spring game, but I've watched every throw he's made in his college career. I feel a lot more confident that he's going to be able to make that completion in that money down type situation than Gavin will be, which is ultimately like if Gavin was able to make those completions, he'd probably still be here, but he's Mm -hmm. time and time again, four out, sorry, five out of our six losses last year, we were within one score in the fourth quarter. You're going to say Ohio state. (laughs) We threw three pick sixes last year. All three of them were losses. So, like, we had a really good team last year, and we had so much more we could have had, but it just didn't work out, which is fine. I mean, we had a game like Michigan State. We had no business winning, too. So you kind of got to take the good with the bad. But at the same time, 
that margin of error for us is so was so narrow last year that we can't really afford to have that again this year. So I think that's the primary reason. If I had to point to one being why we, we decided to, to change things up. And the timing mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to talk about, um, do you think that, like, what is the primary reason, do you think, that Greg made this decision now versus in the summer? I really think he's just he's just genuinely a nice dude and cares about the culture of his team. I think they just knew yep. Ethan was the guy, and it was just like, hey, I'm going to give Gavin a chance to leave. Like I said before, you're you're screwed if you if you don't if you want to play this out the summer, you can, but yep. you're kind of screwing Gavin a little bit. And end of the day, they did what's right for Gavin, and they made the right decision. I think, and uh, well, debatable, but um, I still think you should have went in the summer and said, "Fuck it." Like, sorry, bud, this is college football. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the show. Um, but now, now, now Gavin's going to get a shot to probably go, I'd say he's going to drop a level hundred percent. Um, I don't know where exactly I, if people say Western like group Kentucky, of five, you think, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say a group of five would took a, take a chance on him. Um, people keep saying Kentucky and I'm just or Western Kentucky and I'm like, mm, probably not. They throw the ball like a fuck. Yeah, I was going to say they're like kind of an air raid type system, right? Yeah. But that's like full blown air raid. And it's like, yeah, I'm looking at the kid now, 62% completion, 3,300 yards, 31 touchdowns. Yeah. I don't see that happening. Uh, it makes sense geographically, but not from that perspective. Um, I don't know. I really don't know where he goes. Um, hey, hear me out. Service academies make a lot of sense right now. <laughs> Just triple, triple option. option would be he'd, perfect he'd be for Gavin. Perfect. It really it. would. Um, now, obviously, that comes with a uh, you have to do a, a duty afterwards. So, or term or why, well, why can't I think? I can't think of the word. I think we all had to do a duty after watching yeah, him play quarterback. <laughs> it's fair. Hey, um, Mexico Mike, let's go. Um, hey, guys, guys got but, one beer in him. Doesn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I think I think one other thing that's important too to talk about is that this kind of stops the quarterback conversation narrative in the media too. Like, mm-hmm. it would have filled so much content for us, and we would have loved talking great. about it. But it just kind of like. This is our guy, and Greg did this last year too with Gavin. At the beginning of the summer, he basically said, "Like this is the winner." And let's be honest, like he didn't really have an op- as much as they want to talk about. They had an open competition last year. They didn't. This mm-hmm. was they yeah. wanted Gavin to succeed, and they were giving him every opportunity to do it. So when I say he had the longest leash, Gavin didn't necessarily look the best out of all the quarterback group. And I know we've had people speculate on this, but mm-hmm. let's be honest, Gavin was oh. not the best looking quarterback most of the time last year. Um, he did have great days. He did have bad days and other quarterbacks who were no longer here had good days and had bad days, but there was no, like, I think it's more definitive this year that Ethan looked better than Gavin than Gavin looked better than any of the quarterbacks last year. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, I'd say Temple's QB one was pretty decent at times last year. Um, yep. I don't even know if he's QB one, to be honest. Um, I don't think he is. I think he's, uh, he's, he's QB two at best. Oof. Um, uh, yeah. I would have liked to see what um, he could do, but, um, but this, this drives things full steam ahead with the mm-hmm. media narrative and the locker room narrative because there's, yeah. I'm sure, plenty of guys who are really close to Gavin and plenty mm-hmm. of guys who are, you know, they brought in maybe at the same time as Ethan. Like, it, I'm not going to even name names. I'm not even saying that people have these, you know, divisions, but I'm just saying that, like, mm-hmm. having that defined, like, you're going to be the starter just kind of sets the course. Like, the captain of the ship has said in Greg Schiano, mm-hmm. this is the direction we're going. Yep. This is how it's going to be, and that's just how things are going to be. And you kind of mm-hmm. got to be a, a good, uh, you know, member of the ship, or you, you don't. Um, that's kind of how things are. And I, I do think it makes sense. It's, it's always easier to say things make sense in hindsight, and hindsight mm-hmm. being a couple hours here. But I understand yeah. why he did it when he did it, personally. Yeah, I get it. Um, I keep looking at options. Jacksonville State, Rich Rod, used to mobile Ooh. quarterbacks. It's yeah, an interesting yep. one. Uh, Middle Tennessee State, local kind of ish. I don't know. Uh, regardless, um, sounds like a Johnny's backup quarterback um, for now. I think AJ is going to push him a lot. I think AJ, despite having a bad spring game, had had his moments this spring. Um, I think he's a damn or will be a damn good quarterback when it's all said and done. But uh, I don't expect him to really go after a, a backup in the portal. Number one, because you you know how hard it is to get a portal quarterback to begin with. Number yeah, two, like yeah. number two, like number two, you want to convince this guy to be a backup, like. Hey man, I know you like were pretty decent. You started like seven games at your G five school, but you want to be a backup for the year in your final season of college football? <laughs> it's a tough sell. And I think yeah. there's a reason why you rarely see any college programs with more than three scholarship quarterbacks anymore. 
because mm-hmm. that fourth guy is almost it's always going to try and go play, and it makes sense. And if you're not the backup by the time you're a sophomore, you're probably leaving too. It's just the mm-hmm. reality of how things are. Yeah, so we'll wait and see what happens there. But I don't think they're going to get one. I think Johnny is probably going to be QB2, and he looked good. He looked decent in the spring. So, I mean, uh, spring game specifically, I think he what? He had the best percentage, I think, right? Yeah, Johnny, yeah. he looked really good in the spring game. I mean, he had that that deep pass that I thought was one of the best throws of the day that was dropped by DeAndre Johnson mm-hmm. for a short fire touchdown. I mean, he just kind of – I think they were talking about on uh, – you know, the Scarlet Faithful podcast where he just kind of has a great feel for the pocket. Whereas it just felt like it felt like Gavin was like the ideal kind of athlete for the quarterback position in terms of arm strength, in terms of mobility. Mm -hmm. Um, He even had like pretty good mechanics. Like he, you know, he's got the frame, but it just seemed like that kind of like understanding, like the innate understanding just, it was never there. Whereas a guy like a Johnny kind of has that doesn't have the same physical tools as Gavin. And I don't think even AJ does, but, you know, you have to have this general sense for playing the position that I don't think Gavin ever really had or yeah. ever, never really trusted his himself enough to kind of fully just take those instincts and run with them. Yep. So it is what it is, but we don't have to worry about this all summer now. So it's nice and uh, got your QB one. So we'll see what they can do or what he can do. Yep. I'm excited for it. It's uh, It's going to be interesting to kind of, see how things take shape now that uh you know the, the most uh, pressing topic of the off season has been decided i don't know what that was so that was apologies wild, wild bird. um <laughs> those are those birds behind me whatever they are yeah um another kind of big news item today that dropped was the men's basketball big 10 schedule dropped yeah um if we want to pull that up i think aaron brightman has uh, the i have the uh the ruckers men's Thing pulled up the instagram account oh yeah i was i was just yeah. looking at her it's tweet um yeah, i was on twitter right now pull that yeah, up either or whatever all right so, so if we're looking obviously there's 18 teams now in the big 10 which is hard enough to believe as it is right mm-hmm. um so the uh with the, the three teams we play a home and home with is michigan penn state and purdue which the first two teams i mean those are some pretty soft target. Maybe not soft. I, I don't know. Like, any time there's a new regime, a totally new roster, it's kind of like you just it's a toss up with Michigan. But Penn State, I feel good about having a home and home with Purdue. Steve Beigel just seems to have Matt Painter's number, especially when you don't have Zach Eady. I feel good about That's that. That's gonna be interesting. Yeah. Yep. Um, the home only schedule. They play Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan State, UCLA, USC, USC, and Wisconsin. I feel like the home only schedule is a lot of the teams I expect to be in the top half of the league this year. Do you agree? Yeah. Um, I mean, Minnesota shocked people last year. I think they're going to do it yeah. again. I think they're a good team. Iowa always rebuilds pretty nicely. Um, Illinois is always a st- uh, top tier. Mich- Michigan State's top tier. I don't know about the Pac-12 teams and how they're going to adjust. It's going to be interesting, especially because they have one of them has a new coach. So, yep, yep. Um, um, then the, yeah. the away only teams are Indiana, Maryland, Nebraska, Northwestern, Oregon, Ohio State, and Washington. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the uh, the Gavin goggles game at the rack isn't going to happen next year. As you really think. hoping was really you hoping for a, an opportunity, <laughs> yeah, to uh, really. Uh, me and 8,000 of our friends to tell Gavin how we felt about him uh, going to Nebraska, but not going to happen yeah. next year. Yeah. Uh, they're not so tough, though, I feel like, most of them. Like, that's that's a nice schedule. I mean, don't get me wrong. Indiana's it's, – it's hard to play at. But are they going to be yep. any good? I mean, they just put together a bunch of pieces and paid a lot of money, but still got a coach at the end of the day. So – yeah, and we saw it last year, too. They got guys like Kalel Ware that basically did nothing. You know, mm-hmm. they didn't even make the tournament last year after spending oodles of money on guys like Mackenzie and Baco, <clears throat> the aforementioned Kalel Ware. They just they dove into the portal and uh, paid a lot of money for their recruiting class and really mm-hmm. didn't get them anything. Yeah. Uh, the West Coast trips are going to be intriguing. I think Oregon's yep. going to fit in like a glove, and they might go right to the top or near the top of the Big Ten. Yeah. Um, also, that should be a game Rutgers fans should uh, get a little excited for because that, that guy kind of, you know, stole multiple players from Rutgers at this point. <laughs> yep, yep. No love lost there, uh, given that they took Eugene Omorori and uh, 
Jacob, Jacob Young. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see. Home and away, though. I mean, Penn State, that's a close one. Fans can go to. Purdue like, is away, like you said. Um, Michigan, whatever. Um, that home UCLA game, I keep looking at it for the sole fact that there were rumors a couple months ago that if they get the home game with UCLA, it's going to be at MSG. I'd keep an eye on that. Mm, yep, we had heard that. Um, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they played at least one game in MSG next year, and you shouldn't mm-hmm. either. It would be a great environment. Um, I think you know, Rutgers took over Madison Square Garden when they played Michigan State a few years ago, and it was mm-hmm. one of the better basketball environments we've seen in a while. Yeah, so. conspiracy theory, though. Bronny comes back. USC gets bumped right into that slot, and they're playing in MSG. <laughs> Yeah, as, as much as I'd love to see LeBron come out and sit courtside at the rack, I definitely could see that too. Uh, I think that one makes a, that. Yeah, a little more sense from a star's perspective. Yep. Um, yeah, no, I mean, two away games that, like, I mean, local ish, you're going to go to Maryland. That's cool. It's local. Penn State's local ish. Um, I like this schedule. I really think it lines up pretty well for Rutgers. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a it's a favorable schedule, and let's just uh, we'll see how the roster shapes up. No more news on that for anybody who might be asking. That will be, I imagine, coming soon. The portal's closing, so the names have kind of locked themselves in, and uh, Rutgers will. I, actually, you do have some updates on that. Now that I'm thinking about it, if you want to kind of dive into some basketball some stuff. Yeah, yeah, you have some updates on Supreme Cook and others. Yeah, I forgot about that because um, I posted it like two days ago. Yesterday, actually, I lied. Um, yep. Yeah, so Supreme Cook's a legitimate like candidate for Rutgers transfer portal target, we'll say. Um, obviously, playing for Jay Young definitely helps things. Uh, a Pikel disciple. That's that's a good one. That's yep. hold on, I'm on to something there. The Pikel's disciple. Pikel disciple. Uh, um, anyway, <laughs> along with the fact that he would be a day one starter, that's obviously an easy selling point. And uh, he doesn't have a ton of interest i was told which is not a good thing but he was a starter last year people are a little concerned with his size at 6'9 220 listed if that's true i don't know um but when he was i did the math when he was matched up against guys that were 6'10 or taller last season he averaged 11 and 8 um the lack of blocks at all mostly um is a little bit concerning but you got to remember this is a guy that's probably going to split minutes with lathan somerville i think ogbo could probably get five minutes a game if need be um and not to mention, two of those games against uh, guys that were over 6'10 were against UConn, the two-time defending champs, and he posted yeah, stat lines yeah. of 18 and 13 and 12 and 8. That's all yep. I need out of a center, basically, um, because all the rest of the guys are going to do the rest of the scoring, and he's a great rebounder. He's not a good rebounder. He's a great rebounder. Great on the offensive glass, um, the defensive glass as well. Um, he's good with the little putbacks. Um, or he'll probably draw foul. Worst comes worst. But a really good rebounder, maybe not the sexy name that people want, but I think it's a guy that kind of fits the mold to almost give way for Lathan to kind of become the starter midway to late in the season. Yeah, I agree. I think we're probably going to be surprised at how much Lathan plays next year, given the, uh, the amount mm-hmm. of coverage we've given to potential portal targets and uh, you know the amount we've talked about. You know, how much Cliff has played the last few years, but yep. we'll see how that thing goes. We still have I think uh, the whole team is supposed to be on campus by, what, June 15th? I think it's 15th. I think they said. Somewhere around there. So Ace will be there earlier, technically. Yeah, so basically, like, we still have six, seven weeks to get this roster figured out. Michael will mm-hmm. get it done. I have no doubt in that. And uh, I know it's t- tough to preach patience, especially when we put out, like, constant updates on these things. But mm-hmm. I have full confidence that the staff will get a roster built around Ace and Dylan. I, I love the three additions they've already made, and it looks like they want to add two more. So we'll see yeah. how things go. You see more names coming in uh, you know, throughout the last couple of days, and I expect even more surprises tonight. We'll see how things go. Um, is there anything else we didn't hit on before you wanted to head out here today? Um, like I said, I don't think they're going to go for a backup quarterback in the portal, but I will say there's one name that kind of intrigues me a little bit. It's former four-star Taquan Roberson, Jersey guy, played at Penn State, limited action at Penn State. Um, so Big Ten experience, four-star recruit, played at UConn towards ACL junior year, came back senior year, threw for like 2,000 yards, 16 touchdowns, uh, nine interceptions, eight interceptions, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, immobile. I mean, if you want an experience backup, guys, you have to convince them, number one, to be a backup, but – Yep. I, I think that might be the one you probably take a peek into. 
I don't think they're going to personally, but if you were going to take a peek at a backup, that makes too much sense to me. Big 10 experience, starting experience, decent, solid, uh, solid quarterback play. It's all depends on if he wants to be a starter still or not. That's the issue. But, uh, definitely one I would keep an eye on. He's small too, which kind of goes away from what they're trying to do, I guess, mostly. Yep. Um, New Jersey guy, I personally, like you said, don't expect it, but you know, Mm -hmm. we've seen crazier things. I, I just think they're kind of set with what they got. We got three scholarship quarterbacks, three guys they really like. So yeah, that's kind of how I see things playing out. It will be interesting though. It might be one, uh, weird tackle away from a true freshman coming in and starting the big 10, which, uh, you don't typically like to have drawn up, but yeah, not many teams are flying with the kind of, uh, the depth that we used to have back even five years ago. So true. See how things go. Yep. Um, so, that's all I got there. All right, guys. Uh, well, we are still doing the giveaway. Uh, that giveaway will be announced, uh, some point in the next week, week and a half. Um, mm-hmm. three prizes given out. It'll be a cornhole Rucker set. It'll be a signed ace or a signed Dylan Harper card. And it will be, a uh what's the third gift the the jersey the, the full stitch Rutgers football jersey so if you want to be entered into that write a, an apple review uh mentioning gimme 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 uh or right in the comments of this video gimme 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 uh and somewhere in the comments don't just make that the only part of the comment we appreciate you writing a little bit more than that um but we thank you for listening we thank everybody who's liked and subscribed you got to over 4k thanks to all you guys so yep. uh, keep it up Um, But for me and Richie, it's been another edition of the Night Report Podcast, signing off.